your anxiety comes from you don't know where you're going to charge. And I think if we can start to really change the game, improve infrastructure, you know, create an ecosystem where we instill confidence amongst EV owners, that's going to be the game changer. Welcome to the Optimize Workplace. Today's conversation is focused on sustainability and the renewable energy landscape. So my next guest has over 25 years of experience within the energy sector, bringing creativity and innovation to his work as a global energy strategy leader for EY, Ernst & Young, if those of you who aren't familiar. He also leads the Global Energy Mobility Solutions, helping his clients every day navigate the process of EV, for those of you who don't know electric vehicles. I'm an EV user, so hopefully we'll convince you by the end of this conversation why it's so important and why it's really changing the landscape of today's energy use. Please help me welcome Mark Poltelli to this conversation. Hi, Mark. Hey, Fran. Great to be here. Fantastic to have you. So for those of you who don't follow me on LinkedIn, Mark and I met um, at the um, Strategic Growth Forum event for EY uh, back this past November, I am in full disclosure an EAN. So I'm part of the entrepreneurial network for EY. And they did a phenomenal job at uh, this SGF <laughs> event. And it really is amazing because it brings together thought leaders, innovators, influencers, experts, and tons of people like me, entrepreneurs, who are really trying to stay at the forefront of what's happening today in across lots of different energy uh, sectors and industries and just the gamut. And so he was leading a really, really cool uh, presentation and demonstration that they were having at, as a part of SGF. So Mark, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Fran. I mean, it was it was great meeting you uh, back in Palm Springs, as you said, in, in November. And uh, yeah, we were leading the um, illumination experience at the Strategic Growth Forum, the EY, uh, hosts um, every year for, for a good number of years now. And this time was a chance for us to, to showcase, you know, the advancements in electric vehicles, you know, in, in the energy transition, in sustainability. You know, so so we, we thought long and hard about, you know, what we could do and how we could create a little bit of drama, um, you know, in, 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 the, uh, in the experience and, and provoke, you know, thinking and, and um, and different views and different perspectives. So, so we did a few cool things. So, so we we showcased kind of our technology around how we're helping clients all across the world, not just in the US as well, advancing their e-mobility agenda and and how they uh, electrify transportation uh, broadly. Um, we then gave an example of some of the technology that we're seeing. So, we had one of the e-bikes, so the electric bikes. Uh, it was a I guess a motorcycle that that has a, a I mean, battery. Bike user. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I'm, I'm um, talking my language. Yeah, and uh, you know, so so we had the the e bike there, and um, you know, obviously showcasing the innovation that's happening on that side of the house, where you know, battery swapping and, and battery as a service is 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 a really um, innovative area that, that's growing. And then we had uh, something a bit unique and special. We, we had a, a Formula E car there. So, so for, for those of you that are listening that don't know what Formula E is, F Formula E is, is a, a car racing, so a single-seater car racing championship that only races electric race cars. And they race all around the world, um, really highlighting you know, the advancements that we're seeing in, in electric and battery electric technology. Um, trying to create a fan base, you know, for for EV uh, enthusiasts, and and we had the car there, um, you know, showcased at the illumination experience. Um, not only did we have the car, but we had the driver as well. So we had a uh, good friend Lucas Degrassi, who, who now drives for Mahindra Racing, um, and also an EY ambassador for for the work we're doing around e mobility. And uh, I think that was a real great opportunity for us to, to really showcase you know what's happening in racing which you know the technology that is being developed is is uh, is now finding its way into the cars that we drive today and will drive in the future um and it was great to capture your attention and, and meet you there for the first time yeah it was amazing uh, he mark is being incredibly humble about the presentation it was just the illumination experience was something i'd never seen before i recently traveled to dubai 
So when you talk about amplifying new world thinking, right, and just cutting edge, uh, it was it was a great follow on to that just to be able to see that and be in that space. But getting back to Mark and his team and what Lucas was doing and shout out to Lucas, because he said he wanted to. I hope you didn't forget, Mark. He wants to try to bring um, one of those races to Washington, D.C. So I sit in Washington, D.C. And he says, let Biden know that I want to bring a formula, uh, formula E race car experience to downtown Constitution and Pennsylvania Avenue, which I think would be epic, amazing. And we need to do that. Like slam dunk. We need to do that. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> but yeah, it was amazing. I, I'm hoping that you can kind of touch base a little bit on where you see the evolution of this going. But before we get there, can we back up a little bit? I would love to hear a little bit about your story and what brought you to this energy set, what brought you to this industry, this sector, um, and just a little bit about your path. Yeah, I mean, the the story started when I was um, 16 years old, um, you know, was trying to find my way out of school and, and try and, um, you know, figure out what a working world would, would be like for me. And um, my passion even back then was was cars, right? And, uh, you know, the only motivation I had was I wanted to go to work and earn some money so I could buy a car. So I kind of didn't really focus a lot on school and, and just fell into a, a, a job actually where my, my dad works, um, which was on electricity. Uh, so it was like the uh, public electricity uh, company in the UK. And uh, so, so I joined there as a 16 year old, you know, straight out of school, um, you know, didn't really have any life experience, uh, didn't have any real interest in the energy sector or, you know, I just wanted a job. And, um, you know, to kind of fast forward it a bit, I think by the time I was 18, I, I was running, um, you know, some of our industrial workforce teams where they would go out and dig up the roads and put in new you know, electricity connections. And, um, you know, I had this role of kind of managing like a group of like 20, 30 people. And I was 18 years old and, and I loved it. You know, I loved the whole people, you know, management, um, you know, and providing leadership and all of these guys. And they were mainly guys back then, right? I mean, there was no women in in the, in, in that type of work in, in, the, uh, in the sort of 90s. And, um, I, they were so much older than me as well. And I was telling these guys, you know, what to do. And, and I found a real, I guess, affinity with, you know, leading people and, and um, you, know, you know, trying to, uh, you know, make them, help them do things that, that they didn't think they could do and try and inspire them and be a great team and, and all the rest of it. Mm. So, so that kind of fast forwarded, you know, into, into a career in, in the energy space. Um, you know, so I was working for this utility for, for almost 20 years. And, and I had many, many different roles, you know, from, you know, managing, um, you know, this kind of industrial field staff that would, would go out and fix, you know, people that had power cuts and, and they would restore their, their energy supplies. I was running some of our big contact centers, so four or 5,000 people that would answer the phone for people that, you know, had problems with their bills or, or needed help, you know, with their energy. Um, and then I, I got into other areas such as uh, the nuclear industry, um, you know, helping to set up training facilities. Um, and then finally, I, I, you know, sort of landed in in helping to keep the lights on in London. You know, so I was uh, I was the guy that, you know, was helping running all the operation centers to, to help keep the lights on. Um, and then it came to a point where I wanted, you know, I was in my mid 30s. I, I wanted a change in, in career. And, uh, you know, maybe experience new experiences, you know, new people. Um, but I had all this, you know, 20 plus years of, of energy experience. So I had to utilize it. So, so I joined EY um, in, our, in our global uh, energy business, um, you know, running all of the work that we do in EY across power and utilities, oil and gas, you know, mining and metals. And, and spent seven years there, you know, really helping our clients, you know, transform their businesses in, in the energy transition. You know, so if we think about, you know, the last 100 years, 150 years, you know, we've all consumed energy in the same way. You know, it gets generated somewhere, it gets trans, you know, transmission lines, you know, across states and cities. You know, we flick the light switch on and everything works. Yeah. Um, you know, but we're now in a world where there's so many new 
interfaces into that energy ecosystem you know people want you know clean energy so they want to generate it themselves using you know the sun so using solar panels or using the wind you know and, and wind turbines and this creates a completely different uh, ecosystem in in the energy space you know where you know it was always kind of one directional and now you've got people companies industries trying to generate their own electricity integrating in, into the grid and and i had a great you know time uh, you know over the last sort of seven eight years in ey you know helping our clients as i said you know transform their business in this new innovation and, and this new um transition that we're seeing but as let I me said, ask you a question though mark because i think that you're hitting on something that i think is really um important is that because there's so many people that are trying to access energy in a different way, we're at an inflection point, right? That it's no longer just early adopters anymore. I mean, people like me, I'm just gonna tell myself, like I never saw myself driving an EV vehicle. I never saw myself on an electric bike ever. Like I'm not a tree hugger. I'm, I'm not of that sort. I'm just telling myself. <laughs> um, so I think that we're at a real tipping point. When do you feel like that really started to happen where the rest of the world started waking up to the importance of it, but also adopting it from a standpoint of, you know, this is, for lack of a better term, cool. It's interesting. It works for my lifestyle. It's a great question. I mean, you know, electric vehicles have been around for many, many years. But but I think, as you said, you know, the the, the inflection point has been a long process. And it's it's probably been over the last, you know, five or six years, certainly in Europe, you know, where, where that has probably accelerated far more than, than what we've seen currently in the US. And I think there's a number of factors to that. I mean, obviously, you know, if we think about climate change and if we think about CO2 emissions, greenhouse gases, you know, 70% of the emissions that we generate comes from transportation. So if we want to make, you know, a difference in, in terms of how we tackle that, you know, clearly, the, you know the the uh, the car manufacturing sector has has to play a role in in um, in solving for that. So you know we've seen a number of mandates from governments you know all across the world. I mean Europe being probably the most strictest. You know if, if I'm being honest, you know where they've essentially banned the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles from 2030 onwards. You know so if you live in Europe, if you live in the UK, you know from 2030 onwards you can't buy it or you won't be able to buy it. Uh, petrol or diesel car you will only buy electric um yeah. but but i think that most people can relate and engage to you know we want to leave a better healthier um planet for our kids and grandkids and and clearly it's not just about electric vehicles you know i, I was explaining to you around you know where i see the energy transition and that's clean energy, you know, it's e-mobility, it's renewables, you know, there's a whole number of factors that, that will contribute. But obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, my passion was cars and, it, and it's great now to be kind of leading, you know, the effort that we're doing in, in EY around e-mobility and, you know, my role in, in, in helping society transition to an electric car future. What are you most excited about when it comes to that? Because again, now you see, you know, uh, multiple types of brands now coming out, right? From the Lucid to obviously Tesla. I'm a Tesla driver. Um, Tesla has been around for a while. Toyota is now, I mean, there's so many brands that are in this space, even Ford, where it's questionable. My husband cannot stand the new Ford electric Mustang. He's like, why did they do that? They needed to keep it <laughs> as an engine. But, you know, what's your thought process? You Obviously, you are a game changer in the space, innovator, strategist. You've been in this space for a long time. You know, where do you feel like our next big um, uh, trend is coming from in this space? And what are you most excited about? I'm most excited about seeing the the evolution that's going to happen in the next couple of decades. And I think you touched on it as well, Fran, is, you know, existing players having to, you know, redefine themselves, you know, in, in this space. Um, these guys have been building cars, a bit like their utilities making making electricity for 100, 150 years. And now they've got, as you say, some of these new players coming in, you know, mm -hmm. thinking very differently, you know, innovating, you know, almost entrepreneurship like, which, uh, you know, which we'd like to see. And I think what, what that's doing is it's really disrupting um, 
not just the, the industry, but the ecosystem more broadly. It's forcing people, I think, to think differently. You know, and, and you're an EV owner and you know this. The experience of owning an EV, you know, unless you're, you know, fortunate enough that you've got home charging and, and you know, you've got a good um, charging network around where you live and where you travel, it is challenged, right? You know, it's it's not easy to own an EV. Even if you do find a public charger, it's going to take you three or four hours to, to charge the vehicle. And that's not the experience that we've been used to, you know, with, with petrol diesel cars, right? So so I think, you know, the game changer for me is is how do we almost get parity, you know, or, or, or even it become better um, than what we've been used to. So, you know, going, you know, we showcased this, you know, at SGF and, and, and we were talking about, you know, we're seeing chargers now being developed, you know, 600 kilowatt chargers plus, which will charge vehicles in five, six minutes. That now changes the game, right? You know, so can you imagine, you know, where there's this whole notion around range anxiety because of, you know, the battery doesn't go far enough. It's not range anxiety. It's charging confidence. It's charging <laughs> confidence, right? Your anxiety comes from you don't know where you're going to charge. And I think if we can start to really change the game, improve infrastructure, you know, create an ecosystem where we instill confidence amongst EV owners, that's going to be the game changer. I love that. Love it, love it. I can completely relate to everything you said. I we sat out on a, a trip from uh, D.C. to Charleston, South Carolina, and the first thing we had, the thing we had to think about constantly was where are the chargers, where do we stop, and even if you don't want to stop, you have to stop, you don't have a choice. So I think you're right. Um, that's going to be huge in the in the future. One of the things you touched on that I think is, um, you know, since I have you, you are an EY strategist, right? You're, you're sitting on leadership teams with EY, and EY is all about entrepreneurship as a company. Um, I would love for those of our guests and, and our audience that are on the entrepreneurial train and or even if they're not, they're corporate employees, but they're excited about this space and what is possible um, from a clean, you know, energy renewable sector space, but they're new to it. They don't really know where to start, but they'd like to make a difference. They'd like to perhaps put on an entrepreneurial hat, even a, you know, as they say, side hustle hat as a way that they can get involved. One of the things that I loved, I'm getting to my question, but I wanted to say one of the things I loved about SGF is that it really did um, force us as entrepreneurs to think differently about our businesses, right? I'm in the health and wellness space, in the workspace amplification space, and I'm always trying to, to challenge my team about thinking differently, thinking more broadly about how we're delivering uh, the best workplace experience for employees. Um, and SGF really challenged me to do that because you guys brought in the metaverse. You brought in your, you know, immersive uh, illumination. You brought in this Formula E car, which was, if you haven't seen it, guys, you need to go out to LinkedIn and take a look at it because I got pictures on my on my profile. That was really cool. And as I said, Mark has been really humble about it. But for those who are listening that want to get into the space, you know, where are there any areas that you'd say, you know, Fran, this is maybe it's not a hidden gem, but it's an area that's not yet fully exploded or explored yet. And you, it doesn't take a million dollars to get into this particular area of the clean energy sector to make a difference. What was really interesting at SGF, I mean, I don't know how many thousands of people were, were there and, and we interacted with, but interestingly, most of the best conversations we had with people, with leaders, with experts, with entrepreneurs, were most of the people not in the energy space or not in the in the automotive space, you know, and and that was really eye opening because everyone has a role to play. Every industry has a role to play in this energy transition. Whether you're in health, whether you're in um, you know pharmaceuticals, whether you're in uh, government, you know, everyone has a role to play. And I think that w what we achieved, you know, certainly at SGF was use our platform to say, hey, look, you know, the energy transition is here, it's coming, it's evolving. You know, it's gonna take multiple different industries to come together and, and figure out, you know, what, what the solutions are. You know, so if you think about, you know, in your space, in, in the health and wellness space, you know, how do we, you know, how do you guys engage in, in energy in a way that, that, you know, becomes more sustainable, you know, is, is providing, you know, 
um, equipment, uh, healthcare, you know, to, to, to people in, in, in an electrified way where, where we're using, you know, the, the latest technology to, to really um, advance what we're doing. And I think everyone realizes that whether it's from buildings, you know, to the way that they engage, you know, they have a role to play. And what I'm really excited about is, is seeing how different industries, you know, will, will come together. You know, we're seeing OEM, so the car manufacturers, you know, um, start to think about becoming energy providers. You know, so they've been building cars for all of this time, and all of a sudden they know that they have to play a role within the energy ecosystem. So they're, they're learning and finding ways of, of, uh, of figuring out how they get into that space. So imagine a world where, I don't know, you could buy a car from your energy company or you could buy energy from your car company. Um, you know, typical brands that we all know and love will be in this space. And, and that's what's so exciting. And I think that this is a really a time that for all the entrepreneurs out there and all your listeners that, that have a, an idea, you know, is, is let's go for it. Because I think that's where the creativity is going to come, bring in you know, all of these different industries, different perspectives um, to create a better future. Oh, that's amazing. I love that, Mark. I love that. I could talk to you all day. I really could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, you're just a creator. You're an innovator. I love this. So what do you think, you know, when you think about over the next five years, what in your mind are some of the biggest shifts that are going to be occurring that are going to force the hand, right? Because I feel like when you think about innovation, it's because it's a forced hand. You think about um, something as simple as Zoom and being on a virtual right network where it's it's allowing millions of more conversations, millions of more meetings. We don't have to travel. There's so many things that are now obsolete because we have this one platform. So what is going to force the hand? What are some of the shifts you think are going to be occurring over the next five years that are really going to bring this conversation we're having right now direct and in our face, for especially for those people who aren't, you know, maybe aren't necessarily attracted to it, you know, aren't embracing it. I think the whole concept of forcing the hand is 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 a really good one because I mean, I know we've all experienced different experiences over the last two three years with with COVID, but you know that was a real force of hand situation where all of a sudden you know we we were working face to face with people clients, and then you know by the end of March 2020, everyone was sat in front of these computer screens you know having zooms and and team calls and video calls and you know life went on and work went on right and and we still kept going but it was an intervention that made us work and i think that you, you know we're gonna have to see a similar um interjection let's say on 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 ev and, and energy transition you know governments will have to play a role in not necessarily forcing the hand but making it making incentives for people to, to to adopt electric vehicles you know right now in the us you know we're at a tipping point around are the cars electric cars comparable to their gas equivalents you know from a price perspective you know a performance perspective etc and you know we're getting to that place you know we're, we're definitely getting towards that place but then you've got the other situation which you've experienced and i've experienced is you know, there, there's just simply a lack of infrastructure right now. So, so it's this whole chicken and egg scenario where we want people to drive electric vehicles, but they won't drive electric vehicles unless they become confident they can charge them. And therefore, we need to have an ecosystem that supports that, you know. And, you know, so I think intervention to create an environment where, you know, there are incentives uh, is going to be really important. I think... Uh, an environment where there is incentives for other industries, as I mentioned before, to, to be involved, play their role, and um, and create this ecosystem where we're all heading towards the same direction. But I think also, you, you know, that consumers nowadays, and, and I'm sure you know this as well, have a particular um, want and need and mindset, right? They, you know, we, we're always on, right? We, we have our phones, we have our our apps, um, you know, we, we want simplicity, you know, we want it easy and we want it seamless. And the experience of owning electric vehicles isn't that right now. So, so there's going to be a huge amount of, of effort and work to really make the experience not just the same as what it was before, but better, you know, and more integrated into our lives. And, and I think that's the bit that's going to be 
key, you know, in the next two or three years to really start to make a difference um, in EV adoption. It's fantastic. I, I, uh, I, what, what really resonates with me is that there's, we've only just begun to scratch the surface. There's so much more to go. There's so much further we can go. And it makes it exciting because I've kind of accepted what is as an EV owner and an EV driver, but hearing it from your, your, from your perspective, there's so much more that we can do in that. Why are other countries seemingly so far ahead? The U.S. is always on the cutting edge trend, you know, out in front. But on this particular area, obviously, I've gone to the U.K., I've seen it, even Canada, right? I do a lot of speaking um, keynotes in, in Canada, light years on sustainability and things that they're doing. Obviously, Dubai is trying to be a future thinking city. But what is it? Why do you feel like the U.S. is still lagging behind in some of these areas? Well, I think I think places in Europe, and you mentioned UK, probably Norway is another one where they, they've been um, advantaged by policy and regulation. You know, quite frankly, I mean, the government intervention, you know, in in banning uh, internal combustion engine vehicles has has been part of that. You know, plus there's been a lot of incentives, um, you know, to to really drive, you know, the the ecosystem forward, but. You know, I think the good news, Fran, is that we're seeing that now in the US. I mean, all of the, you know, if you take the IRA, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, the IIJA, the NEVI plan, you know, is all designed, you know, to really stimulate the US market um, around EV adoption. So um, I, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing a lag in the US because I think some of the other countries in Europe have, have just started sooner, you know, but uh, I think the common thing that, that we'll see is that, you know, you mentioned this before, most of the brands that we see in, in the US, they also sell cars in Europe, right? And you're not going to get, you know, Ford and Mercedes and BMW, you know, only selling electric cars in Europe and petrol or, or gas, you know, everywhere else, you know, I, I mean, that, that's not going to be sustainable either. And and we're seeing, you know, a number of the car makers now, you know, pivot and they've made some really, really strong commitments even here in the US in terms of yeah. electrifying. So I'm confident that that gap or that lag, you know, will be caught up in the next, in the next couple of years for sure. Yeah, I've been incredibly um, impressed with the fact that, you know, so many traditional engine maker i mean even ford i think they've made the commitment what 2035 that they're supposedly it's, going to in the us yeah i think it's 2026 in europe is it really yeah i mean just to watch this unfold i just want to watch it so as we're kind of coming to a close i knew this conversation would be a quick one <laughs> but a fantastic one i've loved every minute of it um for those who are again listening in who i i think sometimes when people think about entrepreneurship or they think about someone who's uh, in a cutting edge sector like energy, EV, right? They think, you know, being an innovator is is some sort of like secret sauce. Sometimes the questions I get, and I'm sure you get, is like, you know, how did you arrive at this? And what made you do this? And, you know, it's like, look, you don't understand. Like, it's just every day we're in the, you're in the trenches, you're churning all the time. But what would you say to someone who wants to begin to think like you. You are obviously an influencer. You're obviously an innovator. You're obviously a strategist. You've been in the sector for a while, but you know how to think big, I guess is my question. You know, how, what could you say to someone who wants to begin to try to think bigger about whatever sector they're in uh, as a game changer and trying to make a difference? I think it's really about creating an environment where all of those opinions, ideas, um innovative thoughts are, are celebrated right and 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 that's you know i i mean i'm i'm really grateful for for uh, you know the words that you've said fran but i i think i am who i am because of the people around me you know i i think you know i've i've been very fortunate to work with you know really creative teams um you know i've been in a global role for for seven eight years you know where where i've had you know the privilege of working with different teams from all across the world, different perspectives, different cultures, uh, you know, different normalization. And, and, you know, I'm the kind of person that really embraces, you know, that type of environment. And, and I think as entrepreneurs, you know, we should all, you know, be trying to create that environment to, to really spurn the, the next, 
great idea. And I think people work more creatively when you create an environment like that, where, where you respect and embrace, you know, different opinions. And, and I love the, hey, I've got a crazy idea, you know, let, let's figure this out and, and, and try it. And, and I'm always the first, you know, to, to sort of, you know, encourage that because, you know, imagine all the crazy ideas that, that we all have. And, and if, if one or two of them, you know, can be successful, then, then we're doing great, right? And, um, and I, I love working in an environment where there are much more smarter people than me and, and more innovative people than me. And I, I've just benefited from that, I think. But for me, I think it's, it's really important to, you know, encourage those around us, especially the young people coming up, you know, in, in, our, in our generation, you know, where they will ultimately look at things differently to what we've done, you know, and, you know, they, they will question more, you know, why are we doing things this way, you know, that we've always done, you know, why are we not doing it differently? And I think our ability to embrace, you know, that um, that viewpoint is going to be really, really key because none of us like to change, right? We 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 get into that kind of comfort zone, and I think that what we really need in the next few years is is confidence and trust that you know doing things a bit differently, you know, will move us forward faster. Absolutely, I I. I completely concur i think uh you sounds like to you, to me you're inspired by those around you and by you know people doing things differently and different cultures of people um uh, and and i'm this exact same way when you see people do something a little different or think a little different it inspires you to think differently uh to do better to up your game to elevate and to elevate and amplify those around you so i think that's extraordinary and i really really value the work that you're doing i'm looking forward to seeing more of it and seeing what you have i'm sure there's something <laughs> i'm sure there's something in the hat that you guys are going to pull out in 2023 so i'm excited to see what what that brings mark and thank you so much for joining this conversation it was a pleasure thanks very much fran and uh we look forward to chatting again soon absolutely and for those of you who joined us, thank you very much for joining us on the Optimize Workplace, where it's one step at a time, one day at a time, as you try to make the difference in people's lives when it comes to their health and well-being. This is Fran Dean Bishop. It's been a pleasure to be with you this afternoon.